The rule in good real estate investments is to buy low where nobody sees value and then of course create value. Our guest today argues that the opportunity in Region Egg lies in buying extremely degraded coastal lands. Imagine places where there is literally no life, no photosynthesis, no soil, but a lot of waves with seawater. And using the seawater to raise fish, but mostly shrimp and other aquaculture species, use the wastewater of these shrimps to restore mangroves and grow saltwater species, which in turn produce most of the feed for the shrimp. Not a 100% closed loop, but a lot better than the graded coastlands without any soil. Feasible? Probably. Our guest today has grown many, many trees without outside irrigation in the Saudi Arabian desert. Practical and scalable? Let's see. Investable? Let's find out. This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities, and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. Or find the link below. Today with the founder of Regenerative Resources Co. Transforming millions of acres of degraded landscapes into productive ecologies. Welcome, Neil. Thanks, Con. It's great to be here. And to start with the personal question, how did you end up in, uh, let's say, the soil movement? Let's call it like that. I mean, many people will know some of your work. I will let you introduce yourself. Uh, We'll definitely put a a very famous video of you uh, uh, in the links below. But how did you, let's say, roll into this? Or how did you end up spending your your time focused on soil and mangroves? And we're obviously going to talk about that. Let's say the regeneration movement. So I got into the regeneration movement largely as a result of um, travel. I spent a lot of time in Guatemala when I was younger and some time in the Caribbean as well. And the that's where my interest, it, it kind of came by way of poverty, actually. I, I became very interested in poverty in my, in my early 20s. Um, sometime... In there, I, I made the connection between poverty and land use and, and got very interested in sustainable agriculture. Do you remember uh, when or where? That, that, yeah. Was it a click or was it a, a gradual process? Oh, no. I, I was living in uh, a little town called Tekulutan, which is in kind of central Guatemala, south, south central Guatemala, and, and meeting with corn farmers who... Um, were telling me about how their corn yield was going down and they were facing drought um, and they were debating over if they needed to switch crops or if they needed to buy more inputs and, and the um, and I think that was these were some of the poorest folks I've ever met you know and and we we helped them dig a well um we we helped them with with a little bit of water access stuff but but it was that would have been 2001 when when really it maybe 2002 and um i was i i went back and and went to school i came back to the states i went to school ended up studying arabic and economy and economics but um, the, the passion for sustainable ag and as well as sustainability in the built environment, they kind of became my hobby um, where I would. I, I read probably between 2003 and 2008 or so, I kind of read everything I could get my hands on on those subjects, but it wasn't what I was doing professionally. Um, and then in 2010, 
I was offered the chance to join the El Bela project in Saudi Arabia. And um, that was that was my chance to get into this stuff professionally. So at the time, I had very little experience aside from, you know, voluntary work in, in Latin America. Um, but it was it was my chance to pivot into the kind of thing I really wanted to do professionally. So I, I started doing this professionally in 2010. Um, and that project. Um, I spent eight and a half years, eight, eight and a half years working with tribes of settled nomads in the Saudi desert, prototyping a system to uh, reverse desertification, restore the indigenous grazing patterns and the indigenous livelihoods, um, and in a sense, create rural wealth by reestablishing ecological function. So that, that project was, it ended up being very heavy on the regenerative and very light on the agriculture. Uh, but it, it was a regenerative ag aimed at a, a silvopasture system. And that was, that was a massive adventure. The reason I was hired onto that was more because of my language, culture, and leadership skills, more than for my proven record on reversing desertification, <laughs> right? It was, it was that. And not so many people, I think, uh, that have the full package there. Yeah. And on the language yeah, side, and, and cultural and, and the practicalities of uh, that, there was there was a concerted effort to find someone that would be viewed as politically neutral and tribally neutral, um, and that I think that's why they picked an American and a Christian was because I would show up generally with a, as a total foreigner, and there, therefore I could establish a guest status. And in Arab culture, and particularly in Bedouin culture, there are very strict rules about how guests are treated. Um, and so that was kind of the, the social and cultural entry point for that project to happen. Um, but we did, you know, we made thousands of mistakes in that project, prototyping different things, doing lots of small trials. And we had a few very big successes. And the, I don't want to talk too much about the results of that because they're all still um, under NDA. But the the project itself was tiny, right? It was like a hundred acres, but we did have a full watershed. We had the mountains, we had wadis, we had kind of an artificially delineated alluvial plain. And so it was a, a fractal of the geography of the entire west coast of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and that was, that was deliberate. We wanted something small enough so that we could prototype and see some successes, but that would then lead to greater application. Um, I left El Beda in 2018 and determined to not do nonprofit work ever again, unless it was me funding it, right? If in the future I'm, I'm a philanthropist of some sort and able to fund my own nonprofit What's stuff, the main then I'll reason? do it. What's the, but, the um, main, you're very, you sound very convinced. What's the main reason? For, oh, well, for the, that? the, what we built in El Beda was culturally, ecologically sustainable, if not regenerative. Um, but because we were a nonprofit organization, um, and because we were prototyping, the, the financial side of things was always a struggle, right? Which is typical of all nonprofits, right? You spend a huge uh, amount of energy. It, yeah. On that, right? On getting the money in yeah. and not so much on putting it to work. Yeah. Well, exactly. And so, uh, for, after eight years of running a nonprofit, I said, okay, whatever I do next, it's got to make money. Because that's how, that's how the, the snowball effect happens, right? If you're making money, then you can go do it again. So where did you go next? Um, like what was, but with such a strong so, conviction and very understandable, I think many people so, in this podcast so, would, would be nodding right now. Like, of course. Yeah, absolutely. What's next? And it's, so with I that left experience, El Beda. I, I'll, put, I'll put the video below. There's some, some great, like the, the, the 
difference and the learnings there and just the sheer possibilities are are fascinating especially visually as well so after oh, yes. done that on on the let's say the social side and the the soil side the regeneration side where do you take yep. that experience so knowing that i knew nothing about starting a business i went to stanford for a year um and did what's called the msx program it's it's essentially a one year mba at stanford for people who are mid career um so I did a year at Stanford where I met my current partners through a sustainability center there. We actually won a grant from um, the Stanford, the Tomcat Center for Sustainability, um, which was kind of the first revenues we got in regenerative resources. But but I went to Stanford and said, okay, I'm going to start this new thing I've never done before. I know I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. If I go to a business school and at least do some case studies and some learning and get some tutelage and build a network, um, then I can avoid mistakes when I try to, whatever I try to do next, I know it's going to be a for-profit. I know it's going to be entrepreneurship. Um, and so I was at Stanford from 2018 to 2019, and we incorporated regenerative resources uh, August of 2019. So it was, it was two months after graduation that that happened. And it was, it was very serendipitous because I, I was still thinking I was going to be doing a, uh, a somewhat standard agroforestry business is what I imagined going into Stanford and coming out. Uh, but what is to you? Regenerative standard? resources is, is very different. What is a standard agroforestry business? Uh, what was it back in the day when you entered in your mind? Well, was I was thinking primarily about arable land or hyperarid agroforestry, because um, that's what we did in Albeda was hyperarid agroforestry. And so there were ideas about taking a real estate angle to that. There were ideas about um, breeding and patenting some some trees that are largely forgotten, but have been used extensively historically. Um, so what changed in ideas, that year? No, no. Like what, what, what made it go, I would say, towards the extreme, quote unquote, side, or much more regenerative side? So I, th I actually think that's where the biggest opportunity is, um, is the highly degraded non-arable landscapes. Because... The barriers to entry are a lot lower, and because the um, the potential transformation is a lot higher, right? Like if I go and buy an acre of corn in Iowa for ten thousand dollars, right? It may be, you know, somewhat degraded after decades of you know monocropping corn, but it's still got soil. It's still understood to be arable and agriculture land. It still costs $10,000 an acre to get it, right? Um, whereas the land we're looking at, some of it we can get for $500 an acre. Um, and, and Like in good real estate, the difference is yeah, made when and, you buy it. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so the, the, the barriers to entry are lower. The potential transformation is a lot higher. And and you, it can actually be just as profitable as a field of corn, with much lower input costs. And that's that's the answer to your question of what's something about regenerative agriculture that most people don't think is true. That is true. Um, we can transform highly degraded land into extremely productive land in a way that doesn't duplicate the common problems of monocrop systems. So um, walk us through, like, what kind of landscape are we, that you say it's so much more degraded? What, I mean, this is an audio podcast, obviously, like walk us through visually, look what kind of, how should we, because we can all imagine an acre of corn in Iowa. I mean, most people I think can, or you can Google that. Yeah. Like, what should I imagine the, the kind of landscapes or land you are looking at and get excited about because of the potential? Like what, what, sh what do we see there? What do we feel? What do we smell? So we, so let me talk about regenerative resources a little bit to answer that question. We are focused on coastal landscapes and largely barren or degraded coastal landscapes. Uh, generally in the subtropics or the tropics, uh, 
And what you can, uh, you if you're sitting on one of our sites in a pre-development phase, it's extremely windy, it's very salty, there is no soil, no water, and no photosynthesis. Uh, Not a very nice hyper, place to be. Yeah. Hyper-arid, well, you do have the sound of the waves Which is hitting, nice. hitting yeah. the beach, that's nice. Um, but this is land that nobody sees any value in whatsoever. Um, uh, it is and yet you do salt pans and crest. Oh yeah. 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 That's what we're looking for. And so the, what, what we have developed or rather what my partners have been working on, that they have a 50 year history of developing the system that we're now rolling out. And it's built on the work of a scientist named Carl Hodges, who is, um, a, a big fish in a medium-sized pond, a very a, a very renowned scientist in his day. He passed away two years ago. But Carl Hodges was the first person to be able to replicate the life cycle of shrimp in an aquaculture facility. So the entire shrimp aquaculture world starts with him. Um, but he immediately went into trying to make that system circular. So he he... Um, in the 1960s, he got a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to catalog halophytic plants with cropping potential. Halophytes are plants that grow in seawater, right? And probably the most well known is mangroves. Mangroves are halophytes, but there are also annual halophytes. Um, probably the most well known that, that is edible is salicornia which is also known as sea beans or samphire or sea asparagus, um, and which grows all over the world. But there are hundreds of halophytes with, uh, with cropping potential if they were to be developed. And so what Carl imagined in a, in a world where you've got freshwater scarcity and soil depletion is... Well, the ocean is in, functionally infinite. And if we can grow our food with seawater on degraded coastal land, then we can develop an agriculture that is drought proof, that never cares about fresh water, and that can use some of the worst land or some of the least biodiverse land on the planet to address issues of, you know, food, water security, but also climate and biodiversity. Um, and cooling and energy to some degree as well. And there's a, uh, there's a quote I like to use by Dennis Bushnell. Dennis Bushnell is the longest serving, um, chief scientist at NASA in the history of, he's been a chief scientist there for three or four decades. Um, and I'll, I'll paraphrase him, but he, he talks a lot about greening deserts. And when he does, he talks about using salt water to do it. So when he, when he, he, his quote is, we're talking about halophytes. If we can use, if we can green the desert with halophytes, then we can solve food, water, climate, and energy. Uh, and so this is, conceptually, this is an idea that has been studied a great deal. There are a number of academic institutions um, international and within the U.S. that ha are dedicated to studying halophytic cropping. Um, and my partners were the first to do it commercially. They yeah, ran a that's project. always the question. Like, it's great to be doing this in an academic environment. We know it's possible, but then what holds it back to do it um, yeah. commercially at certain scale and does certain impact? Like, why don't we see the coastal like what you just described, we have way too much of that and it's not being grown with halophytes, basically. So what was yep. holding, or what is or was holding it back? There's a lot holding it back. Um, some of it is that the barrier to entry on these kinds of projects is very high. Um, some of it has to do with the lack of familiarity. In Carl's case, Carl was a brilliant scientist and not a great marketer or a great businessman. And... Um, and so he was the scientist that developed this. They did develop a commercial scale farm in Eritrea from 1999 to 2004. 
Uh, that was, they have done components of this in Mexico previously, in uh, Baye Aquino and Puerto Penasco. But in Eritrea, by year two, they were cash flow positive. They were exporting multiple crops to London and Paris. They had 800 locals employed. Um, they had a war widows cooperative uh, providing fodder for the locals' camels off of this system. That was the first commercial version of this. And that was somewhat modeled on conventional agricultures. They were using mangroves to some degree. Um, then an effort to get this done in Egypt was was thwarted by the events in 2011. And I met these guys while at Stanford. And so what we are rolling out now is kind of the 2.0 version of what was done at Eritrea, where you, you learned at Stanford have, to talk the tech, uh, the tech version, the 2.0. Yeah, there's, well, there's, there's a, there is technology <laughs> course, that we're incorporating yeah, no, now. The language matters but, as well. But it's also that there's a lot more regenerative ag technique being applied to this system. Whereas, I mean, if you look at the photos of Eritrea, there are large swaths of monocropped halophytes. Um, and so we're... Do halophytes um, as, as the, let's say, the, the non-salty water crops um, thrive in, eco, in, in monoculture or is it the same as any, um, let's say, agriculture uh, system? No, it, it has some that? advantages even there because there, you don't get weeds when you're irrigating with seawater, for instance, right? Because weeds can't grow in it. Right. So there are there are still advantages if you just compare monocrop to monocrop of halophyte to typical crops. There are also disadvantages because they're largely undeveloped crops. Um, but so now we are taking agroforestry techniques, incorporating those into halophytic cropping systems and integrating with aquacultures. Um, and so the system we're doing now that we're going to roll out, we estimate will have significant comparative advantages to what was done in Eritrea, let alone comparative advantages to conventional crops that we're, that are in markets that we're going to be competing against. Yeah. What kind of crops are we talking about? Like, because you mentioned sea asparagus, but there are hundreds of others. Like what, what there should are we imagine of other potentials. as, as what, what kind of food or feed are we talking about? So I, well, it's, let's talk about aquaculture. In a typical onshore aquaculture system, and, and this is going to be an oversimplification, but a typical onshore aquaculture system, they're dumping their wastewater into the ocean and creating dead zones with it. That's also their source of water in the aquaculture system. And so they're introducing disease vectors, they're introducing greater risk by using polluted water as their source, um, but they're also causing massive environmental problems and importing all of their feed. Uh, and in a typical onshore aquaculture system, feed is 60% of, of the operating cost. It, it is easily the largest cost in running a shrimp farm or a salmon farm, right, or, or what have you. What we do is we use the wastewater from the aquaculture to grow a mangrove agroforestry. And then off of that mangrove agroforestry, we have a proprietary feed for the aquaculture. So that, that creates serious comparative advantages. Whether you're talking about resilience, whether you're talking about risk and disease vectors, whether you're talking about cost of inputs, Right right now, all the aquaculture producers globally are freaking out because the price of wheat and soybeans are going up, right? So their feed is getting more expensive, which means their product is getting more expensive to sell, but supply hasn't gone down, so the price isn't changing, right? A lot of people are getting squeezed right now because their inputs are getting more expensive, right? And the reason their inputs are getting more expensive is because of the war in Ukraine, because fertilizers are so much more expensive, um, and because of drought, right? Whether you're talking about China or Southern California or Europe, 
or many, many other places where we're in the midst of, or rather in the early stages of what could end up being serious water crisis. And that affects every agricultural industry, including aquaculture. So the fact that our system is circular, um, where we can produce, we're not, we're not at the point that we can do 100% of our feed. But a good chunk already makes a big difference. And what kind of species are, are you planning to, are you growing in terms, because that's always in aquaculture, the big, like the component feed species In Mexico, is we're doing shrimp. In Mexico, we're doing shrimp. Um, probably the Pacific white leg and the blue shrimp. The blue is local. Um, I am not an expert in shrimp aquaculture, but we've got a team member who has 30 years experience only running shrimp aquaculture. Would you say then the, the, the aquaculture piece is sort of the, let's say the engine that then feeds the mangrove and comes, I mean, that's it difficult to the, say, obviously, in, in, in a, no, in a that's circle exactly system, it. but that's the starting point. It is the biological engine for the rest of the whole thing, because that is where our source of phosphorus and nitrogen comes from, as well as the micronutrients that, that are in the ocean water, right? And, but, but it is a seawater agriculture. I need to reemphasize that. We are using no fresh water in our whole system. Yeah, it's good to emphasize we do, that. We do not need it. Um, and that, that is the revolutionary thing with our system. And what scale are we talking about? Like, what's the minimum size we, we should envision? We're not interested in farms smaller than 5,000 hectares. Uh, we are involved in a project that may go up to 150,000 hectares, uh, but there are at least 15 million hectares globally where our system could be deployed. 15, one five. Yeah. yeah. Which is massive. And it's, it's, it's small compared to like the total amount of arable of like of land course, under agriculture. Yeah, yeah. But this is but, not on agriculture now. That's the, but this, and it's not on arable land. No. This is on totally dead land. And so beyond the mangroves, like what else, like that kickstarts the system back. Basically you're, you're producing a big chunk of your feed. And then what else, like what kind of beyond the perennials, what, what are you, what else are you introducing in, into a system like that? It depends on where we are, but the, for instance, if we're, if we were going to do a fodder heavy system, we do a lot of atriplex, we do a lot of salt bush, we do sarcocornea instead of salicornea, but then there's also things like disticlis, um, which used to be a staple crop in the Colorado Delta and, and is largely unknown, unknown or forgotten now. Um, but salicornia, disticlis, sea aster, atriplex, salt bush, there, there are lots of different options. And we don't want to introduce a new species when we're, when we're developing a farm. So we, we tailor the design to uh, local ecosystems as well as to markets. Because what is the market like? I mean, you say it's largely forgotten. You mentioned it a few times on a few describes. Like how difficult, what's the market risk? Like how difficult is it? I mean, on the shrimp side, I, I get it. Lower input costs, much better margin. That seems to yeah. be quote unquote, like a no brainer. But on the crop side, that might be more, more challenging. Like how is that? No, it's, it's, it's not that the crop is more challenging. It's, it's about what's the right market for it. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, one of the things that we produce is a high quality animal fodder that is comparable with corn silage. Um, when you look at the, the protein, when you look at the, uh, the fiber, when you look at the ash content, when you look at all that stuff, corn silage is, is comparable. And so we can go into a country like Egypt where they're importing 75% of all their fodder for their dairy and meat industries and say, hey, Egypt, you've got all this coastline on the Red Sea that's mostly undeveloped. There is no water there. Why don't we grow one of these systems and we can start reducing your imports of animal fodder? We can supply that for your goats, your sheep, and your camels and supplement for the, for the cattle. Um... And we're not going to use any of your fresh water to do it. 
right? That Sounds is like a, a good very, deal. That is a very compelling pitch. Particularly, I mean, Egypt is one of the world's largest importers of wheat. They so when we're talking about food tilapia security, producer as well. they're they're very good at aquaculture. That's that's one of the reasons I like Egypt is because they've got the expertise on hand um, to be able to build one of these systems. Um, very very good human resources there. Um, but when we're when we're talking about food and water security, animal fodder is a massive both driver of desertification and a massive cause of insecurity in places like the Middle East or India, Pakistan, um, or even areas of Latin America. And so that's, that's a, a key market that, that we're going to get into is animal fodder. Aquaculture feed is also a market we're, we're going to be um, in. We will mostly produce for ourselves on our own farms first while we balance the system and tweak things. Uh, but eventually, um, our, our feed, right now, most feed is one third wheat, one, or one third soy, one third corn, or one third bycatch. It's usually a, a mix of those four ingredients. Um, if you can imagine, shrimp don't eat soybeans in the wild. You well, know, how weird. Or, like they, they or, never, or, they would never find corn. a field like that. Yeah, yeah. The, the, cows, there is no cows corn in, either, yeah. floating around in, in the mangroves where shrimp have their nursery. Um, I can't, I can't prove it, but I, I'm just like cows are supposed to eat grass. Shrimp aren't supposed to eat soybeans and corn and wheat paste. Can it um, be good for and them? And so, I'm, I'm, I'm. I have faith that our feed will outperform what's conventional right now. I just can't prove it. And so what's the current status? Because I think we, we as the global, we have talked about coastal agriculture and, and like, I wouldn't say for an extremely long time, but partly maybe yes. And like, how do we get this from a great thing on paper and has been studied a lot in academic research to actually, because these are not the easiest countries we talk about, these are not the easiest entry markets. These are not the easiest things to do from, from scratch, basically. Like what is, yeah. what is next and how do we, we, we pull this literally out of the sand? So it helps that two of my co-founders are the pioneers of this system. Um, and, and like I said, they have a 40, 50 year history of doing this. Carl Hodge is a scientist I mentioned to you was our chief science advisor um, when we incorporated in 2019. He passed away last year, unfortunately. But in a very real sense, the torch that he lit has been passed on to us. So what's different now if they have been working on that for decades? I'm just asking the, the annoying oh, so investor much. question. Like, why now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're great questions. One, of, one is the need is not as acute or the need was not as acute as it is now. Um, two, the development of ecosystem service markets and the recognition of the value of ecosystem services, and in particular carbon. Um, the development of the carbon market, the recognition of policymakers of the reality of all the different effects uh, that we all the stuff we, we group under the umbrella term of climate change that is affecting populations and countries. Um, and then I, the rest of it, I think, is somewhat that someone's got to take the risk to do it first. Um, that knows what they're doing and, and actually has the capacity to execute and pull it off. Uh, but I think we're the first team with those qualifications. And how difficult the, is it to talk to invite? Like, what's the no? Sorry, let's let, let's not put difficult already there. How how yeah. has been the response from investors so far? So we, the most traction we're getting, we we got an angel investment in in 2019, and we've been in really kind of incubation mode ever since. We are just coming out of it. So our first project, we are now starting to the process to finance it. Um, it's an 8,000 hectare project and, um, 
it's taken us this long to negotiate the rights. So we, we started scouting sites. We started putting together a team. We started developing political capital three years ago. And, and if you can imagine, mangroves are a protected species almost everywhere because we've lost half of the world's mangroves in the last generation. And if you can imagine going and talking to an environmental ministry person and saying, hey, we're going to farm mangroves, it's quite a difficult conversation to have. Um, when we started out, the environmental ministry didn't even want to talk with us. They didn't even, they didn't even want to have a conversation. Um, Where are we talking? Or it, is that, com is that, that that's Mexico, okay. right? Because, because they want to protect the mangroves as they should. We, um, had to get some help to get those first meetings set up. Um, luckily by then we had some political capital locally from, from, uh, from Baja California Sur, which is where our project is. And after, at this point, we have, we have a written letter of support from the environmental ministry in Mexico saying we want, we approve the development of the first seawater farm that regenerative resources is going to do. We will study it. And if it works out, we want to assist in deploying it throughout the rest of the country. Right. So it went from, we That's don't even want to talk to yeah. you to, all right, if it works, we want to do it everywhere that we can do it. Um, but it, that, that takes a lot of patience and a lot of know how and a lot of support. Um, and, and that, that transformation, that shift is largely due to one of my co-founders who, um, is a former Swiss diplomat who uh, fell in love with a Mexican lady 20 years and decided to move to Tijuana. Um, he's, he's phenomenal and has been the one largely uh, navigating those waters. The, <clears throat> so at this point, we, we have a number of sites selected. We picked one as the one we wanted to do first. We have negotiated the right to purchase uh, the first 2,000 hectares or so slightly less than 2,000, um, in negotiations to purchase the other 6,000. Um, we have the promise that our permits will be expedited. We have a local team with tremendous expertise. Um, and th this is actually a case where we benefited from COVID because most of our team were working in Southeast Asia or Ecuador in various aspects of the aquaculture industry. And because of COVID, they got sent home to Mexico. Um, and if they can work at home, they want to work at home. So we have snatched these guys up um, and they're, they're phenomenal. And um, so we have a team, we have a land, we have a business model, we have the promise of permits, um, all of which is necessary before you can go you know, to a development bank or investors and say, okay, we're ready for this, right? And that's, it's very, very hard to do that. Um, it would have been impossible for us to do it without our angel investor back in 2019, who um, I think they saw the potential. They were willing to take the risk and be first in. And, um, but without it, it, it would have been absolutely impossible. Without them, it, it, we, because it, it is a three to five year process to get a decent sized project going like this. Now, once you've got a first one up and running, expansion by comparison is very simple, right? You've already got the team, you've got recurring revenues from the project, you've got the proof of concept sitting there, um, and you've got m a lot more resources. So, expansion within country is, is we expect will happen comparatively rapidly. Um, going to a new country, we expect will take another three, three, four years before you get the first project up and going. But then expansion within country happens through that subsidiary and through local leadership once everything's up and running. So it's, it's, that's not an uncommon timeline for blue carbon projects, right? Most blue carbon projects take three to five years to set up, which is why there is so little supply of blue carbon 
in the world because it's extremely difficult to get it to a point that it's de-risked enough for an investor to actually feel confident going in. Because how important is that carbon piece for the business model compared to just the shrimp side, et cetera? For our business model, it's it's a cherry on top. We don't we don't need it. It's just a it's just a positive externality of our system that we can monetize. Uh, the way we are deploying it, though, and this this gets into a really critical piece of of the carbon world. If if we're going to get into this subject, when when we're talking about you know high quality carbon credits, right now you're talking about additionality and permanence and leakage are kind of the three main considerations. And there's a lot of skepticism in the nature-based world about the permanence of forest credits, right? Because, well, what's going to stop people from cutting down your forest in 30 years, right? And so one of our maxims is it doesn't make any sense to grow trees unless you address why people are cutting down trees in the first place. And, and this this is not... I think this is tacitly understood by a lot of people, but largely un, undeveloped or unaddressed in, a, in, I would say, the majority of carbon projects, where permanence in a forestry project comes from sustainable economies. Because otherwise that's it gets the, cut down. Yeah. Co, co, that, that's why that we lost the reassurance. Mangroves. Yeah, that's why we lost the mangroves in the first place. Is is in Southeast Asia, mangroves are largely lost because people are shrimp farmers or they do they set up aquaculture farms, right? But in in Latin America, in South America, in in um, West Africa, it's deforestation for uh, charcoal or to clear it and start doing agriculture or to build fish traps. In the case in Ghana. Uh, people are cutting down mangroves because they want to make a living, right? And so unless you provide an alternate living, people are going to keep cutting them down. And that's what our seawater system builds, right? The, the, and we, the name for this is Regenerative Seawater Agriculture, or RSA. That's what we call it now. In Carl Hodge's time, they called it ISIS, Integrated Seawater Agriculture Systems. Somehow you have to change um, the name, yeah. Some, somehow the, the name ISIS just doesn't have the same kind of cachet or, or positive connotation it used to. So we now call it RSA, or Regenerative Seawater Agriculture. But what Regenerative Seawater Agriculture does is it builds a circular regenerative economy in these coastal areas. So let me tell you one, there's a project we're working on in partnership with a few, with a handful of fishing villages in Mexico. And their catch has decreased by 90% in the last decade, right? So where they're used to catching 100 fish, they're now catching 10. And they are facing total collapse of their communities. Um, and when, and this is this is a pattern happening everywhere. Coastal fisheries are being degraded globally. This this is not something specific to Mexico. I have been um, either tangentially involved in, or consulted with, or been informed of other similar projects in Senegal, Ghana, Gambia, Ecuador, Mozambique, Oman. Um, where it's the same, it may not be 90%, it might be a 50% drop in the last decade. It's still destructive. But what, yeah. it's, it's massive. It, it is a massive, massive driver of degradation. Because what happens when you can't, you're a fisherman, your dad was a fisherman, your grandpa was a fisherman, and you can't catch fish anymore, what are you going to do? You're either going to poach illegal species, right? I have talked with families that are hunting sea turtles. Because a sea turtle will feed your family for a week and they feel tremendously guilty about it. They don't want to do it, but that's how they're feeding their family. Um, you poach illegal species or you start cutting the mangroves down. Right? So this, this poverty degradation yeah. trap, right? People are like, okay, 
short-term needs trump long-term sustainability. I'm going to cut down these trees even though I know it hurts me in the long run because that's the only option I've got, right? That poverty degradation cycle needs economic development to interrupt it. And that's what our RSA does, right? So with this group of fishing villages, the we have like a 30-year vision that we have developed together. Um, and we are doing a strict mangrove restoration project with them at their request, right? And that that's just a straight blue carbon project, right? Mangrove restoration. Um, but and so how do you work with those villages in Mexico? All, how, are they, how are they part of it? Well, we, we were invited to go meet with these folks by one of the villagers three years ago. Um, and that began our, our uh, engagement with them. Over time, we have developed very good relationships with the, there are more fishing villages in the area. There are uh, three that are working with us quite closely. Um, and the long-term vision is we build an RSA on their land and that creates jobs for the fishermen so that the fishermen can put the fishery in rest. Essentially, it allows them to stop fishing for three to five years, let the fishery rehabilitate, and then begin to fish again, but manage that fishery as a commons under sustainable management techniques. So in the end, we really envision three or four projects with these fishing villages, one of which is, or two of which are mangrove restoration and seagrass restoration, the mangrove restoration we're already engaged in. The third would be developing an RSA farm big enough to hire all the fishermen and create that local economy. And then after that, put the fishery into rest for a number of years. And then we, we would not be part of this next part, but it allows them to work with the government to set up either a cooperative or some kind of organization that allows them to manage that fishery sustainably as a commons. Um, that's that's like the 30-year vision with these fishing villages that, that we have engaged with. Um, and the mangrove restoration project is the first one because it's it's actually easier to do than setting up an, an RSA in this particular area. But that's that's how we see RSA being deployed in, in these kinds of circumstances, is this this is the economic system that intercepts and interrupts that poverty degradation trap. And how, like the blue carbon piece, we hear a lot about it. We, I don't think we see too much, like how, um, how tricky is the market or how easy is the market? You say there's not a lot of supply. Like how do you envision selling um, that part, even though it's, it's quote unquote, just a cherry? Um, but how how difficult is that going to be, or how easy will that be? It's going to be super easy, because um, we are where the bottleneck is. It'll be easy to sell. Developing it will be a little bit is tricky, right? That's why supply is where the bottleneck is, is because it's very tricky to develop. Um, in the RSA system, it's just a matter of building the system and doing the science so we can get good estimates on the carbon. We know it's going to sequester carbon. Um, we don't know how much, particularly when it's net of all the infrastructure that goes in. But the that informs a lot of our decisions, right? So we could go on the grid for all the power and pumping of that system. But right now the grid is basically diesel. And so if we are, so we're going to set up our own solar system uh, in the future, there's potential for wave energy as well on these systems. But on our first project, it's going to be solar, which brings our carbon expenditures way down, right? Um, the kinds of buildings we do will largely be low carbon footprint buildings. So it's not just going to be cement structures um, with lots of corrugated steel. So that the the desire to be able to market our blue carbon comes net of the entire development. So that, that informs our decision-making around that. But then we know that mangroves sequester carbon more efficiently than any terrestrial ecosystem. Um, 
And we did do, or not we, because I was not there, but my team did do initial studies of this in Eritrea that gives us some baseline numbers and also informs, in some cases, how our system will be different than what Eritrea was. But the, the science will be a little bit expensive, right? Because somewhere between 70 and 90% of the carbon on our system will be soils rather than in biomass. There's all sorts of shops popping up where they're like, we're going to use satellites to measure your carbon. And I'm like, well, that's great for the biomass, but it tells us nothing about the soil. And that's where 70 to 90% of the carbon is. Um, there are, oh my goodness, there are dozens of new entities popping up where they're like, we're going to verify your carbon with satellite data, and then we're going to put it on chain, and we'll web three everything and, and refi your carbon. The, it's it doesn't address the issue, right? The real issue is how do you inexpensively measure soil carbon? Um, and we're just going to do it expensively at first, and then that at least gave, gives us a baseline estimate for expansion within that region. Um, and of course, the levels are going to be extremely low to begin with. If you look at the the land you're you're purchasing, oh, the baseline is zero. Is zero, yeah. The baseline is the baseline is easy to establish. It's zero. There is no carbon in these soils. It's it is salt and dust. It's basically no soil. Um, yeah. There's no soil at yeah. all because there, there's no photosynthesis. Um. So yeah, the baseline's easy. There are a number of shops that we like that we are collaborating with in that world, some of which are Web3 oriented that, that seem to be ahead of the pack on that. Um, but for us, in the RSA at least, our financial model is built basically without soil estimates incorporated because we don't know what it's going to be, right? Um, it's looking good because that, I mean, we've watched prices quadruple in the last three years. You know, soil, blue carbon was eight to $10 for in 2019. It's now above 50. Um, high quality blue carbon, it, it, it's over $50 a ton right now. So, so it, I mean, that, bo that bodes well for us because not only are we producing blue carbon in the RSA, but RSA, in, in my opinion, is the linchpin to successful blue carbon projects globally. Um, because if you don't build an alternate economy, you're not going to have permanence, right? So our blue carbon will be higher quality than standard stuff because we can address that permanence question a lot better than just a standard reforestation or restoration project. Um, and that is one of the big questions. How do you guarantee that people aren't just going to come cut it down later when when the checkbook is tight, people can't tighten their belts anymore, that's what they go and do. So what our system does is that it helps it helps people that would otherwise be degrading that ecosystem. It helps them become stewards. Because the ecosystem services of a mangrove forest are so much higher than anything you could get out of cutting it down and selling it. Charcoal, if yeah. you if you look at the the holistic value, you know just the services provided to the health of a fishery and the quantity of fish that that grow in a healthy fishery next to a mangrove forest versus an unhealthy nursery um, or an unhealthy fishery next to a degraded mangrove forest. The difference is astounding, right? But if you degrade the fishery that's not helping you anymore. And then you degrade the mangrove forest and then you have total collapse of your community. So this is how you reverse that cycle and help people become stewards of those landscapes rather than the major cause of degradation. And what have you looked at? I mean, the scale you're operating in is the conversation around, let's say, stabilizing local climates or What's the effect of the mangroves on the local, the full ecosystem? I mean, you mentioned this, I see you start laughing. Um, you cannot see that on the audio, but like you mentioned that in, in the project in Saudi Arabia, this was a fractal of the full landscape or the full watershed. How is that thinking 
now and how is it being used or is it being used in these kind of projects? So, because we talk a lot about carbon, but I think it seems like the water cycle is more interesting than carbon. Maybe not to find the water cycle is super interesting, and I wish I could share with you who we're working with to measure that stuff, but I can't. And we'll talk about it in another time. Uh, the I, well, as soon as I can publicly say it, we'll do a press release because it's really exciting. But um, the greater effect of this is that, um, so. We talked about fishery health. We talked about carbon. Beyond that, there's biodiversity, water, cooling, sea level rise, and storm protection. All right, so where in places like the Caribbean or Mexico where you do get hurricanes, mangroves are the greatest protection against hurricanes, and our system will duplicate that ecosystem service. Uh, so, for instance, if you're ever boating on the ocean and a big storm is coming in, you're supposed to park in the mangroves. That is the safest place to go. Um, so storm surges, hurricanes, that is uh, that is a an ecosystem service. I'm not sure we have a way to monetize that right now. If there is a way to monetize it, it would be with the reinsurance yeah. companies. Um, but then that's also very location-specific. Yeah. And the locations we're looking for tend to be rural and, and right, we're not doing this we're next to a city like Miami. Miami doesn't have thousands of acres of degraded barren land next to it, right? And if they did, they'd want to build more Miami, not build a farm on it. So there's, there's a mismatch there to, to some degree. On the water cycle... We know our system will increase freshwater resources, both in terms of rainfall creation and in terms of intercepting flash floods and restoring shallow aquifers. We don't know how much yet, and that is something that we are where we have a a set of collaborations that we're going to put into practice to measure that on our first farm. All right. So, in Eritrea, we did. Co- the project in Eritrea cooled the local climate by two degrees Celsius. Wow. That's and how far did ama- that get? Like local as in right above or right around? Only only in the immediate vicinity. Okay. But still. Uh, but massive. that was only that was only a thousand hectare project. Right? As you as you expand and, and grow to scale, that the question is at what how many microclimates do you need to affect or create before climate. you start changing yeah. climate? And I don't know and the answer to that. What is a microclimate? That. Nobody knows, but it's a very it's a very valid question. Yeah, no, we are going to answer that question as part of the R and D around our first farm, and we have a, some really exciting collaborations. And mangroves are exciting built around that compared to forests. Like, what's the like the effect of mangroves? Of course, because they are at the ocean of, of all the flooding and, and the storms, etc. But in general, affecting the, the water cycle with their feet in the so, water. I, mean, I imagine it, it, they it do is, that a lot. Yeah, yeah it, it is the edge, the first edge within, if you're looking at a closed loop water cycle, it's one of the edges where you can make the biggest impact. But um, so you've got the cooling You've got the increase in in um, water vapor from the evapotranspiration, and you have an increase in ice nuclei, right? Also from the evapotranspiration, right? Every tree does this, but they give off a part of their respiration. They give off volatile organic compounds that, in the atmosphere, will break down into ice nuclei, and then they assist with cloud creation, right? So that's that's the rainfall side of things. That's not necessarily an effect that will be felt locally or even regionally, right? So, so mapping out the precipitation shed of a given project is, I don't know that we're going to do that because it, it would be neat to know, but it doesn't necessarily move the bottom line. And it doesn't, if there's some PhD out there and you want to do like a post Somebody post-doc, wants to pay for the rain. Yeah. If, if somebody wants to do yeah. that study, you are welcome to come and stay on our farm and measure it, but that's not something we're going to pay for. Do you ourselves. envision like a situation at some point where this is like in, in certain projects, maybe where it's relatively easy, quote unquote, to measure and you know, okay, if we restore X amount of hectares here, 
we know we influence uh, precipitation like x kilometers or miles that could be quite far away because some of these systems uh, they're of course not linear but they could be interesting no, there are, parties there down are the ways. line that said oh, we would love <laughs> for more of this to happen because we need yeah like, i don't is that too complex it's not too complex it, it's it's there are shops out there who do that kind of modeling um i don't know that that would be compelling enough to say fund this um, because we want rain you know <laughs> Could you get Panama to pay for that in El Salvador? I don't think so. For sure, with you know, blockchain, you can. Could you, no. could yeah, you but... get Arizona to pay for that in in Baja California? I doubt it. Not not at this point. Maybe maybe if we had better modeling and proven the whole thing out, then maybe maybe the reinsurance people do. But it's I don't think it's necessary. I'm I'm happy to provide. Rain and this, this is one of the yeah. yeah this is this is one of the challenging things is we're providing we're trying to privately finance something that creates a great deal of public good right it it's it's the opposite of privatizing gains and public and making the losses public right is which is what the banks did in 2008 you know they privatize the gain but make the public pay for it. this is the opposite we are trying to privatize. Which is not game. a good investment. I mean, it is but, if, but you the, if you create a lot of public good and a lot of good in is, general. Yeah. Is there a way to get private finance for a public good? It's very tricky, and so I. But that those that is blue carbon at the end. Yeah. Those positive externalities will inform our marketing, mm-hmm. right? When we when we go retail to sell our goods. I'm going to be able to say, hey, you can buy shrimp that destroys the ocean or you can buy shrimp that grows a mangrove forest. Which would you rather eat? You know, I'll be able to say I'll be able to say that in our marketing and we'll have the science and the proof to back it up. But some of these externalities that are positive, we're we're just not going to be able to monetize those in the near future, in the distant future, maybe. Um I'm okay with that because it's awesome. You know, it's awesome. And uh, so to, to, to be able in the future say, hey, Mr. Corn Farmer, too. further yeah. up the watershed, we're giving you this rain. You know, to be able to say, just to be able to say that we're making it rain and to have the science to back it up. Who else can do that? You know, yeah, yeah. that's and awesome. Probably you can, I mean, you can model it and probably you can track it even and and somehow link it back to your mangrove forest where the yeah. evaporation started and that that shouldn't be too I'm, I'm completely out of line here but it shouldn't be too difficult for sure at least but that that no, would be we, like just then able to say it we made it rain in this watershed not too much not too little yeah. but enough to yeah. like a proper rain that's that's on the rainfall side of things the other thing is that because we're in deserts We're, we're also dealing with flash floods, right? When it does rain, you tend to get flash floods. And our system, instead of, instead of letting those flash floods run into the ocean, our system intercepts those. We, this is part of the design process and part of where the Albeda project bleeds into our work. But by intercepting that and having, you have a kind of a seawater layer underneath our soil. And then what it will do is it will create a freshwater lens where the fresh water will float on top of the seawater. And then further up in the watershed, it will start to restore shallow aquifers. Um, so we, we will increase groundwater by intercepting that surface flow in addition to increasing rainfall once we're at scale. So that's, that's super cool. Um, I don't know that we can monetize that. We don't really need to at this point. If there's an opportunity in the future, great. And so, I mean, we could talk about this for for hours, but I want to be conscious of your time and ask a few questions because I know you have to go at some point for an investor meeting. But what would you tell, I mean, it sounds like we're in the project developer phase, which sort of reminds me of the renewable energy sector and a number of years ago, depends where you are, which renewable, but you have these shops yeah. like yourself that are privately funded in this case through a family office, through a, an angel investor, sorry. And they are developing projects, which obviously need other finance. 
Like, what would you tell yep. investors now? What is their role now? If they get excited about blue carbon, mangroves, restoration, rainfall, the whole shebang, what is their yep. role? What should their role be? Obviously, without giving investment advice, but what would you tell them as their role, what they should take as their role to, to kickstart the system, this, this whole regeneration system? I mean, this is, this is what, this is the role that I'm playing right now. This is the phase that we are in. We are actively financing our first pipeline of projects. Um, and we're also doing an equity raise into RRC, the U.S. entity. And first off, I would, we are not talking a lot with VC. VC in general is a bad fit for this, in my opinion, because of the timeline and because of considerations about being partnered with local entities, our, our exit is going to look different for our investors. Um, how come? But so what do you? We, what what could be so, like an exit from the Mexican project or from a project? What? How do you envision that? We envision um, that the first money in. Essentially, we're selling equity into the first project, where people get a percentage of the cash flow. Um, the change in land value also underpins the value of their share in that SPV. But then, when they want to exit, we're going to buy it. Right. We're not going to IPO. We're not going to, we're going to buy it back. That's what we want to do. Just to make sure that the land never gets speculated or what's the reason behind it? Or because you think it's such a good investment? Both. Both. Um, we're the right people to manage it in, in partnership with our local partners. Yeah. Because you don't want at some point to, but it is a, a village, gigantic hotel. Yeah. 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 Exactly. How do you That's also that? how part do you of what informs that? the how exit. You, like if, how do you make like sure that doesn't I'm, happen? That somebody comes with a billion dollars and says, "Let's uh, develop this coast into the next Miami." Just a yeah, random and, and example. We'll, and we'll just say thanks, but no thanks. Um, the, I mean, the change in land value is significant the way it is. There may be opportunities to put small tourism developments in there. I mean, if we're next to a good surfing wave of course, yeah. on our, on our 8,000 hectare farm, there's no reason we can't put 20 hectares into a, into a little surf spot, you know, why not? With great um, food for sure. Yeah. yeah. With, with great local regenerative food. Um, but essentially because, because I'm partnering with local indigenous communities, and, and it takes two years in general to gain these folks trust, right? We show up, generally we're invited, right? But even so, we're, we're a North American, uh, company from the U.S. coming in and saying, Hey, we want to do all that stuff. And people and don't seen trust many us. Many people knock on the yeah. door and say all kinds yeah. of stuff. Why, of course. why, why should they don't? trust yeah. us? You know, and so it, it takes a good, it takes time to build trust and quite and trust is the most valuable commodity and if i were to go to these folks and say hey partner with us work with us this is what we're going to do and at the same time i'm telling my investors well in 10 years we're going to sell to unilever or we're going to sell to nestle right or we're going to sell to cargill that would that would be an explicit plan to betray the trust of the indigenous communities down the road right so our exit cannot be a typical exit. We're not going to sell to PE. We're not going to sell to a bigger shop that that doesn't see the value of working with the local communities the way we see it, right? I'm not going to betray that trust, which means our exit has to be different, which is why VC is in general a bad fit. But development banks, green bonds, blue bonds, um, private equity and family offices, That's that's where... You know, starting out, we're going to have to have the higher cost of capital on our first project. Um, but eventually, I see us funding almost every project through much lower cost of capital in the form of green and blue bonds, right? Because we'll have a, a, an extremely, we'll have very valuable real assets underpinning our projects. We'll have recurring revenues. Um, that's enough to, to say, okay, our if our next project is one and a half billion dollars, that that's fine for a green or a blue bond. Um, 
if we've got the whole system proven out, if we've got recurring revenues, if we've got sales, if we've got blue carbon already developed, it's just the first one where we're going to have to take higher cost of capital. Like most developing, most developers. Yeah, you know, like work, most developers, exactly. Yeah. And do you see investors comfortable with that? Like people that have done renewable energy projects, for instance, that, oh, we recognize this. This is sort of the same as it's, 20 years it's, ago. It's very similar. It's very similar to, to the solar world 20 years ago. Um, and we have, I mean, we're in, we're in the early days of this process. We have been talking with some family offices and, and some other groups for three to six months now where we've more or less just said, look, we're still too premature to really have this conversation seriously. Let's get to That's know different now. I, yeah. I did three pitches last week and I'm doing another half dozen this week. Um, but Full the, fundraising mode. Yeah. yeah, but there are serious comparative advantages in our system. Like if you compare to a typical aquaculture, we are going to blow them out of the water financially. Um, you look at a typical a animal fodder system, like compare us to an alfalfa field. We have comparative advantages, not just in the fact that we don't need to pen ten, pay $10,000 per acre to get started, right? Not just in the fact that we can use seawater. Um, I don't know if you saw this article, uh, FarmRaise linked to it. Do you know, do you know, uh, Jace at FarmRaise? They're a U.S. company. We, Does that ring I a bell for you? Thing, but we never interviewed them, so I don't know if I know. So they're a, they they were folks that I met at Stanford, um, but they're a company that, as I understand it, they help American farmers access public monies. Yeah, we chatted about it. We I don't think we did we didn't do an interview yet, but we we definitely connected when they just launched. But they linked to an article, or rather to a study from 18 months ago, I believe, that said in general, regenerative agricultures are 70% more profitable. Which is a study by Jonathan, Jonathan Lundgren, we yeah, had, yeah, which, yeah. Isn't, which we had on the show twice. I will link it below. So it's fascinating 70, if you look under it. 78% more yeah. profitable. We expect, I don't know if we'll get to 78%, but in the aquaculture world, we are going to have serious comparative advantages. Um, and I expect that in 20 years, our model will be the standard model for a great deal of geographies because it is going to be a lot more profitable. And so what um, would you do? Circular regenerative you systems. It? Of course. Yeah. Like, but what yeah, would you do if, as, as a final question, and I've really let you go to go to your investor meeting because we, we've been yeah. chatting for, for a while. What would you do if you had a billion dollars under management? Could be the longest time frame investment horizon if you want to, but it had to be put to work as an investment. What would you do? Yeah. So my follow up question to this was, what's the risk profile of my limited partners on that billion dollar fund? You can go as right? risky as you want. Is this is this is people yours. with a high appetite for risk or a low yes. appetite for risk? I would say high, and you can choose. If if. Because if, if I don't need to diversify on that portfolio, um, I have my eye set on a 300,000 hectare site that I want to buy. Um, it's a $350 million purchase just for you the have some money left for development. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say where it is. Of course not. No. I'm not. I'm, but you would put it in one let's say one slash two, I'm asking this question, not because I want to know dollar amounts or places, but what would you prioritize? Maybe you say I would put it everything in soil carbon measurement tools or marketing of these seawater aquaculture plans or like mango, like what would you no, prioritize? I'd, and you would go for land, which is interesting to, to know. I would go for land right now. Mm -hmm. um, a, you're not going to lose. There's no loss there, right? It's a real asset worth whatever it's worth, and it's going to appreciate in value. But B... But you're going to buy very, very, very degraded land. So there's like you have to find a buyer at some point if you want to yeah. get out of it. And if nobody sees value in there, it, it, it has value on paper, but of course only if you find a buyer. If you want to get right. out, you want to develop for sure. Right. Um, the other thing is I would I would invest in some particular geographies. So I would, of that billion... I would start a pilot farm in Morocco. I would do a pilot farm in Namibia. 
Um, I would do a, an adapted version in Spain. Um, I would automate our system, the RSA system, and then I'd go to Australia with it. Australia is easy, got over a, a million hectares of degraded coastal land um, with easy access to some very big markets um, in East Asia. So I would, I would do those. I would do those first farms in those geographies. I'd do like a big RSA on that 300,000 hectare landscape that, yeah. that I really want to get. Um, but, but it would all go into RSA. And in fact, I'd, I would not be surprised if, you know, within a decade, if we are doing projects at that scale. I hope so. Uh, we need, we're, we need we're to not, go to the billion dollars, dollars per yeah, scale. Because we're, we're not there yet. We, we've got to build our first project. We've got to tweak our system. We've got to develop the IP and formalize the IP, um, which is the next, that's the next three, three, four years of operations for us is getting this first set of pipeline financed and, and built. Um, but after that, we have more leads than we can possibly follow up on right now, much more than we have the capacity to execute on if we wanted to. Um, so expansion has the capacity to happen very quickly. And I, I don't think a billion will be too much. Considering, I mean, I, I always ask last question and I, then I don't. Considering what you know on what's possible, but also the state of the world, you've traveled a lot. Are you hopeful? Or yeah. Not? This is a great question. Um, as a species, historically, we are terrible at preventing disasters, right? Um, and, We've been and a horrible keystone species, yeah. and uh, horrible at preventing disaster. But we, in terms of species on Earth, nothing compares to us in terms of adaptability. At least, at least, um, there are no other vertebrates that compare to us in terms of adaptability. Um, there's no other mammal that's figured out how to live in every major biome climate and biome you know we are very very good at adapting and we can adapt very quickly and history shows that so my my hope and and this is something that our company is our company is climate mitigation but it's also climate adaptation um i am not hopeful that we will prevent you know many of the disasters that we have seen coming for a long time and and look at look at the water situation right now right how we've known for decades that the ogallala aquifer in in the central u.s was being depleted we haven't stopped depleting it you know but once it's gone we're going to adapt right the colorado river in the southwestern u.s it's 15 million acre feet total in general 15 million acre feet all of that 15 million acre feet is already accounted for Right? Every drop belongs to somebody. Demand for water within the Colorado watershed is expected to grow by another 15 million acre feet in the next 25, 30 years or something. Right? We don't have, we, demand is going to increase by another Colorado River. There's only one Colorado River, right? And 40% of that river, between 30 and 40%, is going exclusively to alfalfa. Right? That is one of the stupidest things we can do with that water, but we're still doing it, right? So are we, are, are, is, is it politically feasible that we're going to change how all this water is used across a Byzantine system of laws? No, the water is going to run out. It's going to force adaptation and then we're going to adapt. And then we're we're really good at adapting. To bring back the rain. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's. But not enough to build two Colorado well, rivers. No. So. Does that make me an optimist or a pessimist where I say, yeah, we're good at adapting and we're going to figure it out, but we're not going to prevent these disasters from happening. I don't know what that makes me. I don't know either, but I just, it came up as, as I don't know, I had to think about the, the question as a, as a good final one to, to, I wouldn't say summarize, but just to have a, a look inside your, your thoughts. I, I will say that I am... I am a lot happier as a person working on solutions 
Um, I am not prone to despair or climate despair. I get sad about things, right? Like they just said that the uh, the manatee, the Chinese manatee is now functionally extinct. They don't think it's anywhere. Like that breaks my heart. It does. It's really sad. Um, but the fact that we're working on solutions that, that address biodiversity and carbon and local economies and food and water. Like I feel, um, I feel a great deal of satisfaction working on the stuff I'm working on. Um, and, and I'm confident we're going to be able to, to roll this out and, and make a difference. So, and, and I'll, I'll let me close with one more thing. Um, what underpins the regenerative movement is a kind of faith that humans can be a keystone species, right? Now that is proven if we look at indigenous, at some indigenous societies, not all indigenous societies, but some indigenous societies have had systems that lasted for tens of thousands of years sustainably, right? And, and, and now it's what it's 5% of human population is indigenous and they're stewarding 80% of the biodiversity. You know, they, they are the, the example that humans can be a keystone species. They're the proof of it. Um, and, and I don't want to engage in the noble savage stereotype. I don't, I don't, I don't, indigenous people are just people. They have a set of cultures and, and, and rules and, um, practices that have allowed them to foster biodiversity and be stewards of the earth. That's what all of us should be. Um, at the same time, we're all indigenous to earth. All of us. We belong on this planet and our, and our role is to be a keystone species. And that, that idea underpins the whole regenerative movement. Um, and for me, some of the most sublime experiences I have ever had was seeing birds build nests in trees that I grew in a place where people told me trees aren't supposed to grow. Um, seeing bees swarm on a site where people said, we haven't seen bees here for 40 years. Um, and to know that our work facilitated that Right. And, and it, I didn't go and like trap bees and bring them over. They came. I created, I created the microclimate and facilitated, and, and, and facilitated a way for nature to come back. And all of us can do that on a, a, on, you know, tiny or large scale. But what that did to me internally, um, was quite profound. And, one of the things that I think regenerative resources will do is allow people to to participate in that somewhat by proxy. Um, but I think if more of us had that kind of experience, um, it would bode well for us and for every other species on this planet. And that that to me is, um, you know, the personal underpinning of why I'm part of the regenerative movement. And with that, I think it's a, a perfect end to this conversation. I don't think it's the last time. I hope it's not the last time we, we connect. I want to thank you so much for the work you do. Thank you for showing up here and sharing. And of course, wish you good luck with the investor meeting that follows right after My pleasure. this conversation. That's right. It's in two minutes. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links discussed, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash post. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you like this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.